Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Sheila Segerson, Director of Community Solutions at Maddie's Fund in Pleasanton, California. Next, we're going to learn about behavior dogs, how to get them out alive with Reagan Goins, Outcomes Manager at Cincinnati Animal Care. Reagan will talk about innovative and effective matchmaking techniques and training to get these dogs to their final destination, loving homes. After Reagan gives her presentation, we will have one short video from Amanda Loki at Gateway Pet Guardians. Take it away, Reagan. Hi guys, we are going to talk about my favorite topic, which is behavior doggos. So let's see if I can share my screen with you and we'll get started. All right, we are talking about behavior dogs and specifically how to get them out alive. Um, that is always our goal here. And hopefully today you'll learn a couple of little tips and tricks that might get you to uh, more easily develop a relationship with the community that they want to save these dogs and that they more uh, understand them. So let's talk about how anyone um, gets into this in the first place. Uh, that is the love of my life. His name is Rocket, fondly the Rocket Man. And he is the one that taught me how to learn from the outside in. So I want to tell you a little bit about his story. Uh, he lived at Austin Animal Center and was in their system for almost two years. Um, he It was at a time where... Uh, dogs were, we were really kind of working with these dogs that were next level and Rocket absolutely is next level. He's one of those dogs that does great in shelter, but in a home, he really, really struggles unless he's got that one person that is his. Um, and I started fostering him as my first introduction to animal sheltering. So I fostered him for about six months, uh, <laughs> Lots of different behaviors popped up in there, like territorial aggression, stranger danger, resource guarding, uh, the whole shabam rocket habit. And from there, I was able to kind of see how you make someone fall in love with these dogs, because he certainly had me wrapped around his finger and still does. Um, so I want to take a moment to really push that we are learning from our fosters, learning from our adopters, learning from the public about how we might be able to do things. Um, this kind of woke me up and said, oh, well, I have to have these sometimes difficult conversations with adopters and fosters that are saying, why can't we do this? Um, and our immediate gut reaction might be, no, we can't do this because this is always the way that we've done it. Or no, we can't do this because of this reason or this reason. Fosters and adopters don't come in there knowing your reasons. Fosters and adopters come in there and say, hey, I would like to see uh, Bojangles. And if you tell them no because of ABC reason, they're like, why not? And they pose that really good question of why not? And we're going to figure out why not or how we can say yes. So um, the first thing that comes up when we talk about behavior dogs is normally resources, right? Reagan, I don't have the resources to cater to this dog who may need training or may need management. Uh, I don't have resources. It takes hours to introduce this dog to someone or hours to get this dog through the process. And I just don't have the people surrounding that. I don't have the resources. Um, here at Cincinnati Animal Care, we have focused on something called leveling our dogs. So if you see there from the top, you get uh, in our little cyclone that we've created, our little funnel, you get dogs that kind of get backed up and that's how you get your full funnel. So at CAC, we've started leveling dogs um, by saying, hey, you are a level one. That meets this rubric criteria. You're cute and fluffy. You relatively don't have any issues. Maybe you just came in. You're doing good. Great. That's a level one dog. That should be out in three to honestly five days. I'll stretch it to 10 if you want. Um, so get that dog out first. Then we're getting to our level twos, which may be, okay, it's a, it's a pity. And I love my pities, obviously, you just saw. Um, but we know that they are not the most highly adaptable when people come in and just browse. And so that get, brings me to a level two. But otherwise, you're relatively um, good behavior. You did great in play group, all of that good stuff. You've got no medical problems. Great, you're a level two. And you're like, Reagan, why? Why are we leveling dogs? 
So I want you to think about this strategy as we have this funnel here. What if you turned your easy dogs over so quickly, getting them into a foster home or getting them adopted, giving yourself that time limit of three to five days, I'm gonna get this dog out in three to five days. Imagine how many more resources you will then have to cater to your higher levels, level fives, level fours, different things like that. So this is a strategy that we're trying at CAC and I definitely see it working. Um, so get the low hanging fruit out of your shelter as urgently as possible in order to open more resources up to those behavior dogs. So let's move on. Terminology. Terminology and language is the key to getting these dogs out. So this little mural here has a bunch of different words floating around like territorial, resource guarding, aggressive, defensive, all of those different things that we as shelter people kind of use. And maybe at your shelter, when you say territorial aggression, you all are talking about the same thing, but I'm going to bet not. I'm going to bet maybe we don't have a full solid behavior terminology throughout your your entire shelter that is going to give you the opportunity to speak to each other effectively. So this is one thing that I definitely recommend you can put in. I'm going to go ahead and show you our sheet. Um, this sheet very similarly came from uh, APA and different places like that. I'm going to go ahead and move over here. This sheet is going to seem long and maybe tedious to look at at first, but that is okay. You're going to make your own and make what works for you. So here, I'm going to boost it up for you. You're going to be able to see a whole list of phrases that we use, words that we use, what they mean, and what we need to do to help that dog get out of here. For example, we have territorial aggression. That is a word that sometimes gets mixed up with handler guarding or however you would like to use it in your own shelter. Um, for us, an easy way to explain this is to the public is that they're not great at welcoming any guests. Um, they say, this is mommy and dad's home and I am gonna protect it. And this may look like these moder minor, moderate, or severe um, going to that they will utilize their mouth very quickly, forego any warning signs. Uh, that is what we would consider severe territorial aggression. Okay, but what does a dog with severe territorial aggression need? This particular dog struggles doing this. So that means we need to do A, B, and C to set it up in a home. And we always wanna include things like muzzles for anything that's gonna be a bite risk there. So you see that our personal uh, terminology has broken this out so that territorial aggression means something different than handler guarding. Over here with handler guarding, uh, you might have, it's, it explains what the difference is to us. I highly recommend um, everyone establishing a sheet that would look like this for you. We're gonna go back to our spreadsheet here. And please know that any of the documents that I am uh, giving to you, not a problem. Uh, we can give them to you as well. So let's move on. As we're getting ourselves all speaking about the dogs in the same way, with the same terminology, now we can use the hive mind. So um, I was watching, I believe it was a Haas webinar with Dr. Jefferson a week or two ago, and she was explaining basically what looks like a people map that uh, everyone can see. So to us, that might look like this. So many people are touching this dog in some way, shape, or form, and each person is going to have a different or a same experience that tells us about that dog in that moment and potentially in the future, how they're going to do with dogs, cats, kids, how they're going to do with medical. So it's really important that we are getting notes every step of the way, observational notes from every single person that is going to touch this dog. So up here, you may see uh, our, our intake, we uh, have a contract with the city to take in strays. So that may be ACOs 
or our intake, a finder or an owner is gonna give us notes. The person who is taking in the dog is gonna give us notes. And then you're gonna see for us, the ACO or the intake person provides the dog that initial level. Are you a one, two, three, four, five? And what do I need to do with you? If you have any uh, reference to case management, I know Sheila does a class on that. That's very similar to our leveling process. From there, volunteers are going to touch the dogs. I want to know every experience the volunteer has because your volunteer is going to reflect your community. Your volunteer is going to be your normal person walking into the shelter and saying, hey, this is what I can handle. Here's what I think when I see this, all of these different things. And they're going to also measure how you can educate the public. Are you able to walk your volunteers through how to handle a dog with stranger danger or a really shy, what I fondly call boo dogs um, that are going to hide in the back of the kennel. Okay, well, then I can probably do that with an adopter. And here's how. Medical is going to touch this dog. They're going to give me medical notes. They're going to give me another level if anything needs to be changed. Say uh, the dog has an absolute freak out in clinic. And that's okay. They're allowed to. I would be very scared with all the poking and the needles as well. But okay, maybe we take that dog up to a level two just because we're aware that it is willing to use its mouth in certain situations. Dog care that is taking care of that animal, they are going to be able to tell us so much. Are they seeing barrier reactivity, which by the way does not mean dog aggression? What are we seeing in play group instead? But okay, they're showing poorly, what else can my team as an outcomes team do to help that animal show better? Um, we get meet and greet notes. How did they do with this meet and greet on a kid and different things like that? Um, and then you also have your fosters. Your fosters and your adopters, even on returns um, or even after the case, may tell you something about the dog. You want to capture all of this. So not only are you using all the same terminology in the organization, but everyone in your organization is a part of getting that dog out. It's not behavior team's problem. It's not outcome's problem. It is everyone is working for that dog. All right, let's go ahead and move on. This one's gonna be a little crazy and I want you to take a deep, deep breath with me. <sighs> This is what we call a matchmaker summary. And this is pulled straight from Austin Pets Alive, um, where, uh, by the way, I used to work at Austin Pets Alive. That's why I'm referencing them. Um, they have this full summary written out for almost every one of their dogs. And they have some of the gnarliest dogs in the country and do a great job with them. So we're seeing at the top that maybe, okay, pre-adoption training is required. What is that? Maybe it's, hey, you come and you meet the dog and we're going to set up a special time for you to meet the dog so that a behavior team member can be there to work with you on managing whatever behaviors that dog is exhibiting. And then that is going to help you get them out into a home. They're going to have a point of contact on the behavior your team, they're going to be, we're going to be able to say we, we showed them and we tried everything that we could. Home setup. Low traffic, again, what does that mean for you? Go back to your terminology. Low traffic to some people means a hermit want like me in my little uh, hole and only one person. Or it, the public can come in and say, yeah, my home's relatively low traffic. And then I'm hearing that they're having a party at their house every week. Well, that's not low traffic to us. So we're looking at why um, a flow coordinator could be a person that is dedicated to help get this dog through, maybe um, getting all of those notes from those people, getting them in. You could have um, different people that are advocating for that dog. CGC and top training. CGC is canine good citizen training. And then top is total obedience program for dogs specifically with bites. As if a dog has a bite on record, they cannot be a CGC eligible um, dog. Train your dogs, guys. Working, you don't have to go through a huge... Um, training program where you get a trainer and they're able to do all these things with the dog in a home. No, I need someone to help me. Yes, get that dog to thrive in a home, but I also need them to thrive in a shelter. And so maybe it's your volunteers doing click for quiet. Um, you have little baskets hanging on each dog's kennel. 
and a sign that says, hey, if I'm quiet, please give me a treat. And your public and your volunteers can get in on that. Immediately, we know um, from this, no dogs, no kids, unknown for cats, does great in a home. Their favorite activities, each dogs are individuals. You can't say all level fives are the same because they all have bite histories or blah, 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 blah. You can say, no. Nah. I mean, Captain really, really, really loves the zoomies. And he's a bulldozer and it's really cute. Um, lead with the positives on this what are their skills great qualities if they're super intelligent i have a dog and foster right now socrates who is so intelligent that that is something that will bring someone to adopt him and the other big scary things about him don't seem so scary um it talks about previous history as a lot of people want to know as you're talking to an adopter they say where did they come from well they did this um, their home history and behavior look that it is thorough. Make it in a format that your outcomes team or your matchmaker or who's ever talking uh, to the adopter is able to scroll through quickly and get the basics. And then if the person wants to know more, then let me go through step by step with you on this dog's history. Um, it has things like bite history. Reasons for a behavior consult. For us, a behavior consult is filling out a form um, that is specialized to that dog that is kind of, say, say it's a waiver, a waiver on the dog because we know that this dog has had separation anxiety. We know that this dog is a flight risk and has um, gotten out of yards before. Well, I need the adopter to know that. And then signing a piece of paper that says that I told them that covered my butt in the future. Uh, kennel behavior, medical notes, spay and neuter status, heartworm status, adoption fee. These are all different things that an adopter is going to ask you. And I have a plate right here for this dog. So this looks really cumbersome, but maybe, maybe you only do the dog, cat, and kid scores and the home alone scores. Maybe that's what your matchmaker summary looks like at first. Then you can grow and build into all of these different um, nuances. All right, here's the big fun. Um, I developed this way of matchmaking from my experiences with shelter people talking to me about Rocket. And so, like I said, an outside in perspective, me being the public, what did I want to hear? What did I understand? What did I blah, 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 blah. We speak a very different language in shelter than the public understands. You talk about a waived fee. You're going to have a person come in and say, what on earth does that mean? Oh, it just means that the dog's free. Or you're going to have someone come in and say, you use the word sponsored, sponsored fee. Well, what does that mean? You're going to come in and say the dog's free. So this is how to speak dog to humans. I'm very excited. Um, I use a three-step system that uh, I train all of my team on. The first is to use a human reference. Now, I know a lot of people are like, Megan, you shouldn't uh, humanize the dog's behavior. It's not a human. I completely agree with you. However, I'm not talking to the dog. I'm talking to another human that needs our reference that they are going to understand. And so I often start out with, you know how. Um, this can be a great idea to kind of get them thinking, you know how you get really scared or a person may get super scared when they're in a big, loud, new place? Well, that's how this dog feels, or that's at least the behavior that this dog is exhibiting. Um, another great point is you can host online events to connect animals with potential adopters that way. Um, just do little FaceTimes or Zooms. We have a virtual meet and greets uh, session. So I can still explain all this to them and they're getting to meet the dog virtually. And if the dog is a level eh, two and down, then they just get to come pick up the dog, which is really exciting. So start off with your human reference. You know how you feel this way? Well, that's the behavior the dog is exhibiting. Then let's talk management. Here's the behavior the dog's, dog is exhibiting. Here's how to handle it. So say that um, the dog, let's do stranger danger. So you know how uh, when you meet a lot of new people and maybe it's kind of 
a sketchy place. You don't feel really comfy. And you're at the gas station, ladies, and it's late at night and it's dark. And um, someone comes up to you. Your uh, your reaction is probably not going to be that great. Well, you know how. But here's how we can handle it. So I personally have a dog with stranger danger. So what I say is, you know, the way that I live with this dog is just if someone comes over to my house, the dog goes in a uh, crate or either a room, some closed off area where he cannot access the people. The people don't want to meet him. And I give him a treat. He plays with a Kong, a frozen Kong, and he's super happy to be there. And then he doesn't have to worry about, oh, my God, meeting all these people. Um, another thing is if we're walking down the street and I see people coming my, my way, great, that's fine. We are just going to turn and go the other way or we're going to cross the street. Make sure that you're putting in the ease of how easy it is to manage this. So notice I said, person coming towards you, not going to panic. Person coming towards you, great, that's fine. We're just going to do this. We're just going to do this. Language. Become a studier of language. That is how you get these dogs out. Then we will introduce the behavior word and the dog's behavior. So you will see um, if, you know, we, uh, we go ahead and we approach a new stranger, the dog is not prepared for that. They said, I didn't want to do that. And so they may list out what it's uh what it what they would do physically they may growl they may bare their teeth they may lunge um if they see another dog in uh the if we do only tree activity if they see another dog and you know your dog is dog friendly like they just want to pull and play and oh my god i don't understand why i can't go play um and we would call that on leash reactivity. So we are not introducing the behavior word until the end of the conversation. The behavior word like resource guarding, the behavior word like on leash reactivity, stranger danger, public doesn't know what that means. And if you start with it, it sounds real scary. But we can educate them on the back end of the conversation saying, hey, this is what's called, we just call this stranger danger. Um, for instance, we're going to take a look at parachutes matchmaking. This is an example. Um, my staff came to me and they said, hey, Regan, uh, I don't know how to talk about this dog because he's kind of a weirdo. Um, and we will go right here. And this was the sheet that I made them. So it has at the top that we lead with positive um traits i'll tell you a little bit about parachute um he's a big hound dog and he's a goofball but he's very sensitive and, and kind of changing environment was very difficult for him so for instance in one case he went to a foster home they put him in a crate which is fine to go to bed at night when they woke up in the morning he was growling and lunging at them from in the crate because one, he's very reactive. Two, he's like, these are new people. I was in this crate all night. I don't know what I'm doing here. So the only thing that I can think to do is lunge, bark, and growl. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at. Also, he's a dog that if you walk down the street, you turn the other way because he does have that stranger danger aspect when he's um, on the street. So if I just leave with all those things, parachute's never going home. Let's leave with the positive that he appears house trained. He loves plushy toys. Non-destructive when he's left alone, he's independent. Now we go into that three-step process. Let's talk about, you know how, so for instance, we used, you know how uh, when you go to a hotel to sleep and you may not sleep well the first couple of nights because it's a really different environment. Imagine that's parachute. Um, he feels that way when he goes home. So we're going to talk about management. So for the first week, uh, we're going to put parachute in a crate overnight, make it super happy and comfy. Um, I would tell the person who is in front of me, whether it's an adopter or a foster, that I'm going to reference the moment when he growled overnight. Um, when someone got out of bed and he was in a crate, uh, he gave appropriate warning. That's very nice. We love growls. Educate the public that we love growls. Growls tell you that something is wrong and you can still stop it. Um, that he just needs 
to get to know you better. And here's how you fix it. You toss treats at him whenever you pass by. And oh, by the way, I might show you a consent pet test um, so that you can understand how to work on that with him. Reference about stranger danger, same thing. He doesn't know you, he doesn't know other people, he's in a weird space. Um, so that can be really scary. Uh, in this case, we wanna give him time to warm up. And so what that means management wise is 10 foot bubble. We're gonna see someone come in, we're gonna turn around across the street. If visitors come over, exactly what I said, parachute goes in the room, does not see, same for like delivery people or repair people. Um, uh, and at the end, oftentimes I just should just just meeting him to start off. You're not signing a contract on this dog. There is nothing holding you to this dog if you just go meet him. Just go meet him, see how it goes. And then we can go talk. Um, so that is a sheet that you can put together for certain special dogs um, like that. Let's go back to our slideshow. So circle back. One, we want to be talking all the same language with behavior terminology in our uh, shelters. We want to teach that terminology to our fosters and to our um, adopters and our volunteers and all the things. Second, how can you use the hive mind to gather as much information in a digestible form about these really uh, difficult dogs? Um, I need to see it all on one page that I'm like, hey, here's the breakdown of the dog. And then I can dig in nitty gritty to the specifics. Um, the other thing that we spoke about was the matchmaking language and how we use that. Again, you know how you do this ABC thing? Well, when uh, Micah feels that way, she does this. She may growl, she may push, she may whatever. Um, and that's okay, because if that happens, all you're going to do is not touch her food bowl. You're going to wait until she's done. You're going to throw a snacky treat into the other side of the room and then go pick the food bowl up. Super easy. Uh, and that is what we call behavior word resource guarding. All right, guys. Uh, I did get my one minute warning and I think we're pretty good. Um, if everyone else is good, anyone have any questions, concerns? Yeah, we are great, Reagan. Thank you so much. There were a lot of requests in chat for sharing your documents. People really enjoyed seeing them. We'll be getting to questions after this next video. So let's watch a short video before Q&A from Amanda Loki from Gateway Pet Guardians. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm the Adoption and Foster Manager with Gateway Pet Guardians. We are going to go through how to place behavior dogs today, starting with a program that was started at Gateway Pet Guardians a few years ago called the Unicorn Foster Program. This was started by my predecessor, Brittany Fleming, who has since taken this nationwide and runs a business in helping shelters across the state start this program up. So what is the Unicorn Foster Program? It is a program designed to help save the lives of dogs that many call quote unquote, the unsavable, with help from perks and incentives to fosters and adopters. Now, what is a unicorn dog? A unicorn dog can be anything. It can be anything from minor medical issue, a minor behavior quirk. Maybe the dog is just falling through the cracks and needs a little extra marketing support. That's the great way of this program is that any dog can be a unicorn. Since taking over this program in 2022, I have turned it into a tier foster program. Here throughout the slides, you'll see that my pyramids consist of gray, which is tier one, the middle pink, which is tier two, and the bottom blue tier three. Now, as I go through, I understand that some resources at Gateway Pet Guardians may not be resources that other shelters have. And that's totally fine. What is great about this program is that you can use the resources that you have available to create the unicorn program however you see best fit. Whether it's funds, resources, volunteers, or staff, you can create it how it works best for you. Now, as you see throughout our qualifications in tier one is more minor quirks. Tier two is more moderate, 
in tier three is a mixture of these quarks. You can have one or more for our dogs at Gateway Pet Guardians. Now, what are the perks we offer fosters to get them excited about this program and to want to take one of these dogs home? Now, here in our tier one, you can see that we have events at Gateway Pet Guardians. Now, these events here in our shelter consist of photography sessions with the dog and their foster family. It consists of a one-of-a-kind unicorn t-shirt that is made specifically for these fosters. Access to our Facebook unicorn page that is simply made for free that anyone can get on to vent, to post updates, to ask for advice. And as we go down from tier one to tier two to tier three, we add in more resources for these dogs for support on their fosters. A lot of these that we add in as well can be training sessions with contracted out trainers that we use, training plans that myself or my coworkers create, and also training tools. Again, you can create this however you want with the resources you have. Now, going to the adoptive side, and what makes adopters excited to adopt a unicorn dog is that all these items we give these fosters, whatever they don't use, transitions to the adopter plus some. So the adopters also get these fun events at Gateway Pet Guardians, like a trunk or treat around the Halloween time, because a lot of these dogs with these behavior quirks couldn't go to the neighborhood trunk or treat. So we have that here for them. Any unused training sessions that the fosters did not use. And also our tier three, something very great that we can provide here is pre-existing meds at cost through our Gateway Pet Guardians vet. It keeps the cost low and it keeps us in tune with the dog that we adopted out. Now, how do we find out information about these dogs that come into our building when they live in shelter life? Well, we offer field trips here. Field trips for the dogs can happen through our volunteers or fosters. As long as they sign our liability waiver, they are able to come get a shelter dog and take on an outing. This outing can consist of 30 minutes, an hour, up to however many hours we are open that day. Our volunteers below, as you can see, like to take our dogs on walks through the park, on car rides to get pup cups, and even Melania up top there got to go home to the volunteer's house, and we found out that she was good with cats there. Now, we don't always want them to go to their house because you got to go slow when meeting other animals, but they come back to us, let us know how the animal did, and this really helps with a lot of those behavior quirks, such as stranger danger or leash reactivity. Now, when finding out about this animal's personality and making them a unicorn foster, how do we market them? So to market these behavior dogs, we want to use positive language marketing. This means when you are putting them out on your social networks, or on their bio on your website. We want to use positive language only. We want to keep the in-depth conversation for in-person and the adoption counseling for that. Why, you may ask? Because if that person comes through the door and wants to meet this dog, they already have their foot in the door and interest in them to meet the dog. So you can have the conversation with them about these behavior quirks or medical issues and still have them meet the dog and see if they get that connection. Now, if they don't get that connection, I'm sure you all have many other dogs you can help match make them with, but at least they have their foot in the door now. I want to give example here. Mr. Barley in this picture, he is an energetic pup, but energetic can become negative to some people and may make them move on to the next profile. So a word to use instead of maybe rambunctious or energetic is playful. And then when the person is in the door ready to talk to you about Mr. Barley, you can talk to them about what this playfulness is and what's best for Barley. Now, I want to go to our last slide here of an example of a unicorn foster participant and his fun outcome story. So Mr. Titus here came into Gateway Pet Guardians in 2021 at only eight months old. Being young and adorable, he was adopted pretty quickly. Unfortunately, a couple years later, we got a call from a St. Louis Metro organization that Titus ended up getting surrendered there with not much information. So we 
transferred him back to Gateway Pet Guardians. And within two months of being back, he was really going through fosters and adoptive homes. He had four all together, which is great, but it wasn't sticking. So throughout those conversations with those fosters and adopters, we determined that Titus had some resource guarding issues to people and dogs. So he joined our unicorn foster program. And within joining that program that comes along with these perks that we've been talking about, Titus was adopted out in April, not even two weeks later. And to this day, I get updates about Titus and his father, and he is doing great. Thank you all so much for joining me in this session, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. It is that time again. We have Reagan Goins, Outcomes Manager at Cincinnati Animal Care, and Amanda Loki, Adoption and Foster Manager from Gateway Pet Guardians, ready for your questions. Let's jump into them. Our first question is, our volunteers have not brought up behavioral concerns for the fear of euthanasia. Any ideas on how to get volunteers on the same page as staff to better help the dog? Uh, I can speak for this one. Um, I would ask myself the question, why are they afraid to tell me? Is it that uh, in historical, if they've told me, have I euthanized the dog? You know, we have to take this on ourselves as well. Or if someone has told me, have I presented um, options to help the dog, right? Do you have um, different resources that you can give the dog? Um, if someone is afraid to tell you something, I would really look in the mirror and say, what am I doing that is portraying that um, response and how can I fix it? Thank you. That's a great answer. Our next question is the most upvoted question of this section, and that is we are seeing our lower level dogs have a longer length of stay and starting to deteriorate in shelter. So they require more behavior support and resources than was initially slated for them. Are you seeing this trend? Do you have any suggestions to prevent this? Yeah, absolutely. This trend is happening everywhere. It's huge. Um, and I, I go back to the funnel effect where animal welfare, especially because of the no kill mission, has now focused so much on how we keep the dogs sane and enriched and alive in shelter that sometimes we don't have a lot of resources on adopter, uh, ado adoption counselors and outcomes and rescue placement and all of that. So you get in this dog that I would say is a level one and then I don't get it out in the time period that I've allotted me myself, um, it is going to grow into a level two and a level three and a level four. So we have to remind ourselves of the urgency there, there, I think as we move really into no kill and the whole country is really following along with that, we're losing that sense of urgency of this dog needs out now because less people, not everyone, but less people are going away from the, hey, this dog's here for three days and then done. Thank you. Amanda, anything to add there? Yeah, I wanted to add a little bit there. I think that's a really good time, too, because we're seeing it across the country where dogs are staying in the shelter longer and deteriorating, where some of these programs, like allowing volunteers to take these dogs on longer outings, field trips, maybe in um, a room at the shelter if that's necessary, or shorter um, foster stays at your house, too. We have something at Gateway Pet Guardians called Slumber Potties where they just take them from Friday to Monday, Friday to Sunday, maybe even 24 hours to get that dog out, to have them, even if it's just 24 hours, decompress in that time and really show their great characteristics and not be in that shelter setting for 24 hours a day. So I think that's really important to get those, you know, if you're not getting fosters and moving them as quickly, incorporating other um, plans and things for volunteers to do. 
Next question is about how do you get all team members on board with advocating for behavior dogs? We have a specific program for behavior dogs at our rescue that many staff and volunteer love, but some of our veterinary team members will speak about these pets extremely negatively. Yeah, that's a great question. If you don't mind me going, Reagan, at my organization specifically, um, our veterinarian team is always welcome to come into these behavior conversations, especially on the med side. Are there medications we can add on to this? Um, but we really do kind of focus on the people taking care of them day in, day out, the animal care, the placement team, our outcome team, and us talking and seeing if medication wise can something be done. And then they mainly stay on the medical outcome if a dog has um, you know, medical euthanasia or something like that. But just making it open and transparent and welcoming, letting people feel that they can be able to bring whatever to the table and what they want to be heard. And then going from there and talking as it about it, uh, as talking about it as a team. Wonderful. Anything to add there, Reagan? That was a great answer. So we might be good. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I will say that all of uh, my employees sign a kind of culture agreement, um, which tells you that, that, hey, when we speak about dogs, we're not going to use this type of language. We're going to use this instead. Um, really ingraining in that culture that speaking negatively about dogs is never going to help them. Um, like Amanda said, bringing them into the life-saving conversation. So if they, they have concerns to express, absolutely, we want to hear that. But then we also have to feel like um, medical can sometimes be really, 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 really scary for dogs. And they definitely sometimes see the worst in them. And that's just, it's not fair, but um, that. So I, would, I really push culture agreements. I think they're really helpful. Thank you. And a, a follow-up question for you, Amanda. So if the veterinary team, and I think just needs a little clarification, the question was, so if the veterinary team only helps with medication, how can you stop the negative talk from them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think kind of what Reagan said there too, we don't have that culture agreement, but I would be interested in learning more about that. And that really is where like maybe the leadership team comes forward and has that one-on-one -on -one meeting with the vetting team and how their language can affect the dog and people around them, that labeling theory. Um, because once you start talking about it like that, then everyone else starts to see it. And dogs just Dogs and cats alone act completely different when they are seeing a vet versus just getting out for a day-to-day -day walk. So then maybe we're uh, inviting the veterinary team, hey, come on out to a play group or let's walk this dog and see them in a different light. Thank you. And I'm just going to add in as a veterinarian that your veterinary team should be helping with more than just medication. I know, Amanda, at your organization, they do. And that we know that pain and medical problems are a reason for behavior problems to be happening. So your medical team should be involved with a lot more than just medication. They should be, they also are very concerned about welfare and helping us to ensure that welfare is good. So they should be involved with all the aspects of our behavior programs. I know it's difficult. We're all so busy, but the really it's all about the more we work together and work on the same team, which is what Amanda and Reagan were saying, the more we can get away from this place where there's negative talk happening or when it is happening, it's all to each other instead of behind each other's backs. A hundred percent that yes. And we have had cases where, you know, pain is the reason that a dog is acting up. And once we um, have the vetting team on our side and we're all together, it clears that right up. So very good point. Thank you. Next question is looking at Parachute's matchmaking document. For each dog, does someone write up the matchmaking language? And is this something the adopter can take home as a reference to or foster? It looked very useful. Yeah, definitely. So that came about because um, my team was just uh, not sure how to speak about this dog. And so I wrote that one up just for Parachute because um, he was a high priority dog that week. And they were like, how do, how do we help him? How do we help him? So I definitely think that um, in the beginning, 
as your team is learning this, people who are comfortable putting down that type of matchmaking language can be really, really helpful. You can have a template for it and um, you could bring volunteers to fill it in, different things like that. Um, and then that can be an immediate document that someone opens up when someone asks about parachute and they can literally just rattle through that. Um, right now we don't do it for every dog. We've got over 500 in care right now. Um, but I would love to have it for every dog. Thank you. Next question is for Amanda. There's a question, Amanda, do you use aversive training tools such as prong collars? I saw one of your pictures that featured dogs wearing them. Yes. I, when I saw that come up, I was like, Ooh, I probably didn't make the best choice in that picture. We do not use aversive like the prong collar. That was an adopter right there who had their dogs on the prong collars. Um, now, in my box of tools, you maybe saw like um, a squirt bottle or a pet corrector. We use those when running play groups as um, a to get their like if a dog squabble or a dog fight breaks out to get their attention. But we do not use prong collars, shot collars, things like that. So that is a, a very great, great question. That was an adopter. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you for answering the other part of the question too, before it was asked. The next question, everyone is on the behavior team, smiley face. Getting everyone on the same page with language and providing observational reports is crucial in pathway planning and successful placement. What kinds of staff and volunteer training can be used to get a shared language? Yeah, so um, I am planning on setting up reoccurring uh, trainings for this type of language. It's just something you got to get on the books and you got to get everyone in the same place to do it. And I know that's so hard. It's so hard. Um, but if it's a priority for you, you have to really make it happen. Um, I also like to teach, uh, I also like to treat the shelter like a teaching hospital. If I'm doing something by myself, I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I should be grabbing one of my coworkers, grabbing one of my team and saying, hey, watch me do this. Or, hey, do you have any questions while I'm doing this? So um, I really try not to do things by myself, even though I absolutely uh, could, because you want to treat your shelter like a teaching hospital. Thank you. Next question, how do you deal when there is conflict between volunteers and staff about behavioral notes? For example, if staff doesn't want to give the power to volunteers to add notes on behavioral issues. Yeah, um, again, I come back to our look, your, look at yourself in the mirror. Look at yourself in the mirror and question yourself. Um, if a staff member does not want volunteers putting in any notes and they don't have to go in the system, they could go in a Google a form or something like that. Uh, that's a little bit of a red flag for me. And I would encourage someone to maybe do a pilot program where they just try it and see what comes out of that. And I bet there's a lot of good information that's being missed. I agree with Reagan there, just kind of just try it, opening it up to volunteers because sometimes volunteers at our own shelter get their hands on the dogs some more than myself on a daily basis and they may see something different or you know maybe have them we've had a binder in our adoption floor before where if they want to put a positive or negative note they don't have to come and talk to us if they feel uncomfortable about it but they can write it down and initial it and then we take that into consideration day after day and just look at it if we have some follow-up questions you know like in presentations earlier asking those detailed questions to really get what happened as a visual in your mind um because these people are are handling the dogs just as much sometimes as staff so i definitely agree maybe breaking those barriers down and really getting volunteers involved in these decisions or or conversations thank you Next question, we try very hard to get behavior dogs adopted. I had one of the dogs actually attack me and I was told that we just put a PR post about this dog so we can't euthanize it. Can you comment on this about when do you say enough is enough? And, and I'll add on to that. How do you deal with situations where you just put a PR post out and now you're gonna euthanize a dog? Yeah, I can definitely 
speak to this. Um, worked at Austin Pets Alive for several years, and as Austin Pets Alive is known, it, they have some of, they have that 2%. The dogs that are there are that last 2% when you're talking about 98% to 100. And um, it is a big question every day for all of those dogs. When is it enough? When um, does the euthanasia become a conversation? Different things like that. But I think where it stops is different for each shelter. The shelter that I'm working in, and right now does not have all the resources that APA had and all the training we hope to, and we're going to build up to that. But right now, is it fair for me to say that uh, I have this dog who does cause a serious issue and perhaps maybe, maybe there was a trigger that was missed. Maybe there was whatever, but it was willing to go that far. And um, then you're questioning how many staff members can handle that dog now? Um, what kind of home environment does that dog need now? And I think it's a really group decision between your shelter leadership and your shelter managers and on the ground. What are you willing to say? I have the resources for this right now. I can do this right now. And what can I say that that's something that we can handle in the future. And we are going to strive and learn and do everything we can to handle that animal in the future. But right now, that's just not an option. Um, in terms of the PR post, uh, I, I guess I don't care. <laughs> I'll be honest. Like, if it's sure I put out a PR post and then something changed. The dog attacked someone. I am perfectly happy with having that conversation with the public. Um, it may be rocky and you're going to get some keyboard warriors and all of that, but that's what transparency is. Uh, I put out that this dog is doing great and would love to get an adoption for it. It changed. Something has changed. That's the conversation that I just need to have with the public and explain. I agree with her there. I think the transparency, having your team on board to talk about, um, behavioral dogs and behavioral euthanasia, and then just if you don't have a clear cut euthanasia policy or at least one written up of reasons you may behaviorally euthanize, I would definitely recommend that as well. Great. Thank you so much. We're at time, Reagan and Amanda. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. We have about five minutes left today to today's session, and I hope you can hang with us for a few more minutes. I'd really, really like to thank everyone here today for being so engaged and so respectful of differences related to what different organizations do and work with. We're all different and it's just really heartwarming to experience, to experience how you all have embraced differences today. So thank you about that. Any questions we didn't get to today will be answered on Maddie's Pet Forum. We hope that you'll join us there where we can continue today's conversation. I really enjoyed today and hope you all have too. I'd like to thank all of our speakers, those of you who helped us to get the word out, our team at Maddie's Fund who have made this all possible, and all of you who have joined us today. Thank you, everyone.